Good afternoon and welcome to Hack AI knowledge sharing session on AI and ML applications. Hack AI is organized in collaboration with the STEM Up Educational Foundation, UNDP, and SLESCOM to provide opportunities for school and university students to join the national movement that drives social impact. We are inviting innovators across the country to build AI powered solutions to solve challenges related to selected sustainable development goals. We have a very accomplished speaker to conduct today's knowledge sharing session. And if you have any questions, you can send it as a comment on YouTube or Facebook, and we will be happy to answer at the end of the session. Our speaker today, Dr. Jamie Roche, is a lecturer in robotics and automation in the Department of Mechatronic Engineering at IT Sligo School of Engineering and Design and a visiting lecturer at Loughborough University, London. Prior to coming to IT Sligo, Jamie was a research fellow at Loughborough University, London, working on the multimodal imitation learning in multi-agent environments. The project fund funded by the EPSRC. Jamie holds a PhD for which Loughborough University awarded him the Wolfson Studentship, an MSc in Digital Technologies, an MSc in Bioengineering, a Bachelor's in Engineering in Mechatronics, and a Bachelor's in Technology in Process Auto Instrumentation. His research interests are sensor data fusion, free space detection, human activity recognition social scene understanding, modeling of multi-agent systems with application to intelligent mobility, path planning, and sports analytics. I'd like to now invite Dr. Jamie Roche to conduct today's session. Over to you. Hey, you doing? Um, it's nice to make your acquaintance. Um, I'm going to be talking about multi-model machine learning for intelligent mobility. Um, in terms of the SDGs, this really fits into the smart cities area. So my primary area of focus would be would be sustainable cities and communities. Um, I guess in directly, specifically in applications that my interest is intelligent mobility. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you guys now, um, so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, give me a second. Um, so, um, generally speaking, what I'm going to be talking to you about, about today is I'm going to be giving a brief background and, and, and an introdu the introduction to artificial intelligence. I'm going to describe an architecture platform um, for a mobile robot that I've been working on. Um, I'll be talking about self-evolving free space detection model a multi-model fissure vector network for human activity recognition, and then I'll be concluding with the benefits of the research and some possible future work. Um, so we, we all know that AI has been around for a long period of time. Um, uh, it's gone through several iterations, like prior to the 1980s, there was sort of a top-down approach to artificial intelligence, where we try and find a machine that would be able to do all the things that humans have done. Around the 1980s, we sort of shifted our approach and um, started to focus more on, on sort of a compartmentalized approach to solving AI. This is really where data took off and became most prevalent. Now, in, in terms of how we see artificial intelligence and machine learning, we really see that, um, you know, we, when we talk about neural networks, we see them being the pinnacle of, of um, artificial intelligence. And while that is for the large part true, it's important to remember that it's not the case for everything. So you can't always just apply a neural network to solve a problem. Sometimes a support vector machine would do sufficiently. So it, it really depends on the problem you're trying to address. However, in terms of artificial in terms of artificial neural networks or neural networks or convoluted neural networks, really these these four people or these four groups have contributed contributed most. So back in the 1940s, you had McCullough Pitts with their um their breakthrough and threshold logic. You had Donald Hebb on his approach to neuroplasticity, you had Frank Rosenblatt on developing the first artificial neuron, and you had Jeff Hinton, which solved the back propagation problem. 
And now, without these guys, these are regarded as sort of the grandfathers in AI or in neural networks. And without these guys, the stuff that we're doing today nowadays with convolutional or neural networks wouldn't be possible. Um, so without going into too much detail, I'm going to go move on. So I'll get through this thing pretty quickly for you. I'm not, I'm not bored too many of you. Um, so motivation and context for researching into intelligent mobility or smart cities um, really lies with, you know, in, in, from my point of view, really lies with, um, you know, the number of people that we're seeing um, dying on the roads every year. Prior to um, taking up my research in academia I, academia, I worked as a forensic engineer, so I used to go around road tra investigating road traffic accidents. And I've seen a shift of, uh, in the times and the way cars have been designed and what sort of technology is going into cars. But as well, it, I also saw like how a problem that we've created is, is causing a large number of fatalities. For example, you, in, on a daily basis worldwide, there's an average of two, 3,200 fatalities a day. In the United Kingdom, um, in, in the 10 years to, 10 years to 2019, there was over 2 million casualties. Um, so this is this is a cost of like seven to twenty billion just in the United Kingdom alone. So if you look at the entire world, you see that things are um, the overall cost is huge, and you know the cost isn't measured only in in terms of in terms of finance. Um, now there's really three challenges to to address how you how you'd approach this problem, how you'd pro approach or apply machine learning to intelligent mobility. The main challenge is the high, di high dimensional environment. There's a lot of going on. It's not just a single agent operating in a, in a, in a room by itself. You many different agents operating together. Um, because of that, it makes the modeling of these agents extremely difficult because they're so unpredictable in the nature. Um, you're also dealing with complex, diverse scenarios that are changing on a frequent basis. So if you think about how, how frequently roadworks change the way your road looks it's an, a major issue so taking a, a super approach isn't always possible in, 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 in intelligent mobility because the environment is going to change so dramatically and um, so then on top of that the, you have access to data and um, well we're living in a, a an era of the internet and um, the data that we have that we're using isn't always freely available well, there are large numbers of data sets out there, and there are, the, the number of them are increasing. Um, a lot of the data is being is being held in proprietary. For example, like Google, I only release small quantities of data. So you really have an issue of data disparity. Um, and when you have a situation with data disparity, people who don't have access to the data aren't going to be able to develop um, algorithms that can operate sufficiently in the environment which means the algorithms are all going to be coming from a small set or a small group of society. And then inevitably they're going to build in their own problems without realizing, uh, finding a solution that helps everybody around the place. Um, so that generally leads to my objectives um, for this body of research I was um, working on. The objectives was to collect data using a test platform to assist with the development of multimodal machine learning algorithms for deployment in unstructured environment now a large portion of the problems we all know we all know that we've seen tesla driving their cars around the motorways um, and we know that uh, you know tesla operates quite well in, in in structured environments where you've nicely delineated lines however for the for the most part um we don't have um uh, many many robots or any robots that really operate in an unstructured environment quite well. It's a niche area, um, however, it's an area which we, in, we interact with. So anytime we're working in the office, in the house, um, in a space, uh, in the city, you're always going to see lots of unstructured environments. Um, and it's something that's quite difficult to model um, and get, uh, get robots to work in. Um, one of the other objectives is to explore of this research was to explore uh, machine learning algorithms that are capable to adding um, adapting to new environments and data streams with little or no training. Because you have issues with data disparity, um, it, it's it's while it would be in an ideal world the data would be open to everybody to use. However, it's just not the case. 
So you're going to have to be become, you're going to have to be a little bit more resourceful in how you find and how you use this data. So if you can work on systems that require little or no training um, prior to prior to being implemented, that's it's 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 also very beneficial because it means that you're not going to be stuck with little uh, stuck trying to find suitable data sources for the algorithms you're trying to develop. And then I wanted to investigate um, methods of leveraging multiple heterogeneous data streams to make robust decisions and safety critical autonomous systems. So that really lies in the region of sensor data fusion. Um, no single sensor is really uh, capable of sensing the environment with 100% efficiency all the time. If you think, you know, think about the the application, different sensors that are used in intelligent mobility, things like lidar, camera, radar. They all they all suffer. They're all they're all they're all vulnerable in some, in one way or another. So, for example, with lidar, if it starts to snow, the snow itself can prevent um, accurate readings being taken, and you get noisy artifacts inside the image. A uh, camera, if you're driving in fog, that again um, pr presents a challenge. Um, you know, so it, the idea that you just use one sensor to solve your problems isn't really going to, isn't really going to float. The best approach is to use multiple sensors. And how I always draw parallels between this is, is the equivalent of um, the, the, the five senses that humans have. If you were to remove one of these sensors and ask us to function as the way we do and normally in a day-to-day -day basis, we'd find it quite challenging um, because we'd be needing to, say, for example, use our eyes to find our way out of a particular building. If you remove your vision, this this becomes quite a difficult challenge. And although you'll eventually do it, it doesn't happen. In, it doesn't happen um, instantaneously. Um, so this is why sensor data fusion is is is, is an important is an important element in this. Um, how the contributions of this research was really an autonomous platform. Um, the output of two data sets, an autonomous vehicle data set and a human activity recognition data set. Um, we also generated a self-evolving free space detection model. Um, this is a model for identifying free space. Um, that self-learns. Um, it's a semi-supervised form of machine learning. Um, I also work on um, a multi-model Fisher vector network, and this um, is an algorithm or a network that we use to identify human act activities in point cloud data. Um, I'll go a bit more into each of these as um, I get progress through the presentation, so please do bear with me. So the autonomous um the mobile robot we developed um is essentially we we, we basically we we retrofitted a, a quad bike um the idea was that we'd be able to get a vehicle that could sense the environment and move safely with little or no human impact um we had some conditions that we needed to apply um we needed to get it to operate on um uh, little as data as possible um, to collect data while it was in operation, and um, it needs to be data driven. So we could, didn't didn't have um, a rules based logic approach to this. We had to make its rules or how it planned its path depending on the objects that it encountered, which kind of you know if you think about it is self intuitive. It's um, although it's not necessarily the way most autonomous vehicles are driving nowadays. While autonomous vehicles do use elements like, you know, um, uh, network neural networks to identify humans, the decisions that are being made are based purely on logic and they're not path planning decisions. Um, and our solution was an open source experimental frame framework for indoor and outdoor data gathering, sharing, and experimental validation of autonomous vehicle technology. Um, it looked like this guy here on the right of my screen um it's a quad bike that we retrofitted with a series of different sensors and a laptop we had a lidar we had several cameras we had an ultrasonic sensor array and a, an electronic scanning radar and um, data was 
collected um, on the on the platform, and the platform was driven autonomously with the possible for human intervention purely for safety reasons. Um, it didn't travel at more than 5 kph because the area we're operating in was a pedestrianized area and one of the prerequisites for a license. Um, the platform itself, uh, we broke it down into three different, or sorry, into four different layers. With a sensing layer, a data analysis, analysis layer, a multi-layer context representation, and an application layer. So the sensing layer essentially collects and presents sensor data. Um, things like LIDAR, uh, ultrasound, all of this information is, is, is gathered in this layer. layer. The data analysis layer is pre-processing. It's where the data gets fused together. So the transformation and alignment of, say, the ultrasound to the camera data is performed at this operation or performed at this layer. Uh, the multi-layer context representation it records representation, representational data. So data things like um, where we would like identify free space um, or the activity a human would be located in this region. And then the application there is basically um, the decision making. So what happens with the data as it comes in? So you can see how by using this approach, we kept um, the different types of information sort of, uh, we sort of, I, I guess you could say we, we, we followed something similar to GIS, the way they approach um, geographical information services, the way they approach applying information onto layers, onto maps. Um, so the reason we did all this um, was to collect data and to make two data sets open and available to public. Um, the first data set we worked on was an autonomous vehicle data set. Uh, we had a total of 45 hours of video, LiDAR, and ultrasound data. And breaking that down, we can say 2.5 million frames of video data, 252,000 scans of LiDAR, 220,000 scans of ultrasound. Um, we logged over a distance of 1.2 kilometers in unstructured indoor and outdoor environments. So the routes of which we traveled were over, were in total 1.2 kilometers, but um, we went over those quite a few times. The data set is annotated with seven object classes. And it's an ongoing project to the point where we've expanded this out to Sri Lanka, um, where we're now collecting, well, we were up until recently collecting data off the roads in the Rand, um, Klimbo, and up into the mountains. And one of this, one of the reasons we chose, um, well, aside from having academic links and research partners um, out there, one of the reasons we chose to move to Sri Lanka was because you have a very, um, the road network um, and the way vehicles behave on the road is, 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 is very unstructured. The roads aren't neatly delineated like you get in the UK. Um, there's a quite a heavy number of traffic. And then there's quite a, a diverse range between the cities and up in the mountains. Um, so that, this is the reason why we went out into Sri Lanka um, uh, to try and sort of bend um, the types of data sets that are typically used and use something that's more um, or gather data that's uh, of, of more realistic environments rather than tailor-made tailor-made environments like most data sets cover. Um, some of the data. Um, some of the, you can see some of the images here. There's, um, we are using a fisheye camera in this case, and uh, the platform just drives around logging the data. The data was processed later on, um, uh, but it's generally speaking, it's 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 pretty handy data set, although it's not huge. Um, for the human activity recognition data set, um, we collected a total of six thousand. 712 camera LiDAR connect and um, connect data points. So th this is essentially the post-processed data. So the two data sets serve two very different purposes. The first data set served the purpose of free space detection. And the second data set served the purpose of human activity recognition. The applications while well, 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 the data was collected in the same way, the applications are for two very different types of algorithms. Um, 
the first the first one was looking at a, was looking at methods of semi supervised machine learning. This is looking for applications of human activity recognition using completely using using supervised machine learning. In this, the data set is much more um, is much more tailored. It's been it's been cropped. Images have been cropped. So what we did was we transformed the lines um, lidar connect and camera data together, and we got sixteen subjects performing nine activities um, connected indoors. The activities range from like you know. Walking while carrying, walking while texting, running, carrying a box, lying down, sitting on a chair. Um, each 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 of the two D images, um, the subject was annotated with a bending box, and the three D data we annotated with an activity class. So, in essential, in in essence, you could look at this as uh, as being three different layers. The first layer was a two dimensional image that you had camera data. That was annotated with a bounding box. The LIDAR data, or sorry, the Connect data, which is RGBD data, was annotated with a bounding box and also an activity class. And then the LIDAR data, which is purely just point cloud data, was annotated with, um, with, with an activity class. So you can see how by using classes in this particular case, we sort of um, fuse the three different data streams together um, to develop this one large data set. And while 6,712 um, data points or data, you know, data images doesn't seem that much, it's 6,712 camera, LiDAR, and Connect, so it does it does add up. Um, and you can see some of the data here on the right of the screen. Um, so the self-evolving free space detection model. Um, so free space detection is identified as um, is the identification of traversable space. It's probably the most fundamental element um, a robotic movable, a, a, a mobile robot can actually can actually learn. In terms of what it actually is, is it's every space that the robot can go um, versus the every space that the robot can go. Um, so the main problem is that the majority of the current methods for free space detection has been relegated to some sort of segmented, segmenting network, something like Deep Lab version three or higher. Um, the idea is that you segment the pixels in an image and you classify them depending on what, uh, what you want. Um, these traditional approaches of using deep networks requires large quantities of data. Um, and while they do perform relatively well, they only perform relatively well in the data or data that's similar to the data in which they're trained with. So in essence, these guys have difficulty in adapting to new environments. Now, while this is important, um, th this is kind of the whole point of, of, of one of the major flaws in the current approach of supervised learning, um, the current approach of, of, of networks of, of our artificial intelligence. If you're using things like uh, to um, to make some sort of a classification, your classification is only as good as the data that you've been given. If your data set is inadequate in any way, when I'm, what I mean by inadequate, I mean by like lacking data or lacking diversity, the network is not going to be able to generalize to new, new environments that it encounters. Why is this a big problem? Well, what ends up happening is your model makes predictions which aren't very good. Um, now, in safety critical things like vehicles, driving a vehicle, um, that's a major problem. It also becomes a problem when you're trying to model, say, you know, um, tidal water, water level rises or global temperature rate changes. So all of these things, if your model, if your model, if your data isn't sufficient enough, your model isn't going to be able to predict what's going to happen and make a classification based on that information. So our solution was a self-evolving free space detection algorithm that leverages the relative uncertainty of different sensors to automatically enable new data and relearn the free space when new scenarios are encountered. We're stealing from two techniques, um, a thing called we're using online and active online learning falls in the realm of supervised machine learning and active learning falls in the realm of semi-supervised machine learning. The general, I'll work through the process um, and then I'll just come back and touch on a few important points. But what we did, what we started out was we got a SVM, so we took an image, 
he took a whole series of images. We got the, we got, uh, we trained the platform, the algorithm on 1,500 pixel patches of HSV and HUG. So HSV is hue saturation variance and HUG is histogram of orientated gradient. So we took a little sections of four by four and eight by eight pixels of um, in the image and we made classifications based on those, um, those, those, we classified those pixel patches, um, uh, the HOG, the HSV and the HOG, the HOG values for those uh, pixel patches, we classified them as free space or occupied space. Um, when you run the image through the process, uh, through, the, uh, through the trained SVM model with the little data, you get something that's similar here on the right-hand screen, where by and large, it's classifying the majority of um, the majority of things correctly. Um, you start getting misclassifications in areas that have resemblance. So, for example, in these blocks here um, and this block here, you're getting parts of that being misclassified because it has resemblance to the way the floor looks. We then use um, an ultrasound to generate an occupancy grid map. Um, an occupancy grid map is essentially a discrete map of an environment where the areas, the discrete areas are classified as occupied space or space. In this particular case, the OG map, um, the ultrasound generates the OG map by identifying the region in front of the, in front of the quad bike. Um, and what it's doing is it's saying everything inside this area is essentially classed as free space. And while it would be nice to say everything outside is, is classified as occupied space, it's not possible. But what we can do is we can gain information about free space only. We can use that information to relabel the original image, um, relabel this data as, um, as occupied space, and therefore I increase the uh, the classification, increase the accuracy of the classifier of the of the, the the model that we use. We then retrain the model on um, on the new data and fuse the OG map in with it. And the output is is generally an image that some, looks something like this. Um, in terms of how that performance, the performance when compared to the the most most proficient or one of the most proficient segmentation networks, uh, what we call or what's called as Deep Lab Three, um, we found that we, we we generally outperformed it using our method. Um, you can see that from the confusion matrix, we had a, a, a much better ability at classifying free space and roughly the same as classifying um, occupied space. Um, now, the important thing to note here is that the, 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 way, the, the way our framework or the way our proposed framework is working was it was classifying, it was using ultrasound data to label image data as it became available. So in theory, this, this, um, this technique would become better over time as it encountered new, more, more diverse environments. So the idea is essentially you're starting with a little bit of information, and then as new information becomes available, you're using sensor, sensor redundancy to label the new information as it becomes available. And that way you're increasing the size of the data set every time the framework runs through an iteration. Um, the benefit of this is it becomes, it becomes much more robust and much more accurate. And the longer it's in operation, the more accurate it becomes. The disadvantages of something like this is when you have every time every time new data becomes available, it's it's relearning everything all over again. So it's not most efficient way to process data. Now there is different things that you could look at, like you could look at how you might retain the kernel from one training process over the one training step over to the next. Um, but ultimately, what this boils down to is what's important and how and why do we remember it. So if you think about it, all the things that you encounter on a daily basis, all the things that you remember on a daily basis, you remember them for a specific reason. You don't remember everything that you encounter, you know? So, you know, psychologists will say that 
you remember things because of the amount of senses that were stimulated at the time and the period of time in which they were stimulated for. And this is why something sticks in your memory. Not only that, but your memory is also slightly ductile. It changes over time. Whereas when our technique, it's allowing for the change over time, except it's not remembering the things that are remembered in the past. Every time it's retraining, it's relearning a whole new set of rules. So it's not the most efficient in terms of um, um, how, how well it processes data, but in terms of how well it classifies um, things, it's, 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 it's a very robust me mechanism. Um, you can see some of the comparisons between Deep Love Tree again. <laughs> so we have uh, our accuracy was roughly 74% uh, um, compared to Deep Lab, which is 43%. Um, and that's for free space. We're not free space with 95, with Deep Lab is 96%. So the, there's lots of, there's lots of, there's lots of comparisons to be made. Um, all these metrics in, indicate that this type of, um, of this type of uh, semi-supervised machine learning will outperform um, a traditional supervised form of machine learning. Um, while the there's loads of arguments as to why it's not necessarily a fit, the most efficient, the most uh, efficient way to do things. It is quite an elegant solution. And it's 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 somewhat better, more adaptable um, than uh, things uh, than uh, classification or semantic segmentation networks that rely typically rely on neural networks. Um, again, some of the results. So the next thing that I'm going to be talking about is a multi-model Fisher vector network for human activity recognition. So by and large, the majority of um, majority of techniques for human activity recognition rely on sensors um, being worn on the body. Now, while there is uh, quite a group number of researchers looking at applying um, visual networks to human activity recognition. The most successful and the most um, um, uh, the most common cases are, are usually wearable sensors, things like mobile phones, accelerometers, uh, biomems and bionem sort of things attached to the body. Um, the main, one of the main reasons why I wanted to study um, human activity recognition is because, again, my area of interest was um, intelligent mobility or smart cities and how you might apply that. Um, in the case where you have um, um, a machine needing to make a decision, contextual information is of the utmost importance. You know, While it's very important for the machine to be able to understand where it can go and where it cannot go, the next sort of level down, or as how I see the next sort of level down, is um, contextual information. Because if without contextual information, you can never really make an accurate decision. So, for example, if you're stopped at the traffic lights and you see, you know, a group of people on their mobile phones, you can derive the contextual information that these people are not paying attention to their surroundings, and therefore you adapt how you drive in those sort of environments. Um, because the the um, the environment that you're interacting with, you can understand it. So having contextual information is is really important for making good decisions. Um, the current methods, um, as I said, um, for human activity recognition typically uses like human act uh, uses RGB or DVD or wearable sensors. Um, RGB um, is not particularly reliable because it's very susceptible to light changes. Or B, or G, or GBD, like as in the data you get from a Kinect sensor, is, is great. It's really, really good data, but it's very susceptible to lighting conditions again. Uh, wearable sensors, they're not ubiquitous, um, and therefore not everybody has them. While you can use things like mobile phones, the, a single stream of accelerometer data or, you know, maybe 
accelerometer data from different sensors isn't going to allow you to accurately predict the the finer details between say walking and walking while walking while using a mobile phone and um, so our solution to this is a multimodal fisher vector network for the classification of different human activities by leveraging multiple heterogeneous data streams to make robust decisions in safety critical scenarios um so excuse me So our framework, I'm broken it again, I've broken it down into steps so that people can easily understand it. It consists of a two-dimensional object detector. So essentially because of, again, because we're using multiple data streams, we're using camera, RGB, and LIDAR, we need a nest, we, we need to be able to essentially identify the subject. So what we did is we used a a, a fast a, a fast RCN, a recurrent core, basically ResNet, to identify the region um, in which the subject is performing the activity. So we use an object detector or a person detector in this case. We segment the point cloud data. So once we've identified the person, we align, we transform and align the 2D data to the point cloud data from the LiDAR. We then segment the corresponding regions. So we have 2D segmentation, which is done by the object detector. We use that data to we transfer and align the transfer and align the coordinates for the bounding box into the, into the 3D data, and then extract the human subject from that data. You get something similar to this, where you have like a box, a small region of interest, a three-dimensional region of interest, and this is where we perform the classification on this um, reduced point cloud. Um, we using um, a Fisher vector network or a modified Fisher vector network where we use the min, the max, and some of these functions. We essentially what we're doing is replacing a Gaussian, a spherical Gaussian, on top of the three-dimensional point cloud data. Um, we're then getting a symmetric functions and generally generating a unique representation that's specific for that activity that's being performed. What Good about using this technique over other techniques like voxel net or point net is that um, we're not, for for example, in, in voxel net, you, you're essentially you're creating um, a kind of like a three dimensional occupancy grid, grid, and while it functions really well when you get down to smaller granular details, for example, like when you start looking at like you know objects in a hand whereas you know stand, the processing power becomes um quite it, it becomes more and more complex and, and resource resource uh, resource dependent so the smaller the voxels the less less the greater the pro processing power that is required a similar event happens in point net and the greater the the de details the more processing power is required now if you don't need some very fine details to distinguish between, say, you know, a mobile phone and a hand and that, just a hand. If you're just interested in, let's say, identifying a human subject, voxels and point net work quite quite well. However, when you start to get into smaller detail, when you need to identify smaller detail, you your processing merits become your processing requirements become greater with point net and voxel net. In the modified vision vision vector representation you're essentially what you're learning is you're learning the relationship between the points in three-dimensional space so you're not learning the actual points and the locations of them you're learning the relationship points this is why it's a good application to um human activity recognition is because the relative proximity of each point so for example the point on the foot and the relative proximity to the point on the knee is learned rather than the point, the location of the point on the foot and the location of the point, point on the knee. And why that's important is, is in, if you're trying to classify the activities performed by a human subject, the location of their limbs relative to each other is most important, you know? So um, this is essentially the process. Once, in, once the subject is identified, we can extract the 2G region of interest, label it as a person with a certain accuracy, 
then we have are transformed in a line three-dimensional region of interest, which we then process by the point point cloud classifier. We combine the two of them to generate an image as you see here on the right. And that essentially allows us to determine what activity is being performed and who's um, uh, you know, a person performing what, what activity. We ran some metrics on these and all the metrics show quite favor favorably. And um, we have an average precision of 95%, log average risk rate of, of 0.1. <laughs> Um, for the individual class matrix, uh, confusion matrix for the individual classes, and you can see in all of them we're scoring quite high. <coughs> and when compared compared to the um, to its, I've forgotten which. Oh yeah, when we compared this to PointNet, um, we found that PointNet performed quite poorly on uh, distinguishing between the different classes. Once again, this relies down to the ability for PointNet to um to identify the difference between say walking and walking while holding a mobile phone um uh, you can see some of the results here um person carrying a box person standing while texting person walking while texting person lying down um so th this is this is this is a point that um that we're really we're in, in in this guy so with 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 the human activity recognition it 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 requires you to understand different activities so therefore by its nature it's going to require you to collect a certain amount of data so you're going to have to have some form of data set you can see in in the case of using the multiple multiple uh, sense data streams our requirements for large quantities of data. So this data set that we used, if you remember from the beginning, we trained it. We we, we trained it on a relatively low number of data on, on data frames. So in this case, we trained the network on 5,753 5, 5, frames of lidar, connect, and point cloud data transformed and aligned. This, in comparison to um, uh say something like point that which needed need you know a much higher uh, number of um of uh data points or data frames to be to be to be um to, to return sort of high levels of accuracy um we're on the step towards performing um some sort of social scene understanding using this tech framework um, it allows us to fuse different data types together, reduce the amount of data that necessary to um, get high 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 results, and um, by having the sensor data redundancy. Um, so overall, um, I can conclude that the um, free space diffraction, free, the FSD framework, self-learning, self-evolving algorithm that will adapt to scenarios never encountered before. Um, the human activity framework classifies human activities using point cloud, thus improving the context gathering ability of an intelligent system. And the proposed, the, the autonomous platform that I reported on um, can function in structured and non unstructured environments. Um, how I see these areas of research or what, what I'm doing now, so this was from like 2000 and 2021 um, or 2020 and 20 and the start of 2020 and 21. Um, what I'm doing now is the next step that we've taken forward. So we're going to take some path planning and how we can apply these types of um, uh, uh, free space detection framework into um, uh, into a path planning type system that is using reinforcement learning. So we're sort of drifting away again from the supervised learning element, element, element of things. The human activity network recognition um, we're using. We're applying this more and more, more and more frequently to things um, with uh, social scene understanding. So we've been working on one facet of social scene understanding, where you're looking, you're wishing to classify the activities of the subject and environment. You want to be able to label a scene as you encounter it, the same way we do. So, for example, I used an analogy before where I said when you stop at a light and you see a group of people all on their mobile phones, the contextual information that you can get out of that is people aren't paying attention. So if you were to some way label that image, 
you'd label it as a group of people not paying it, not paying attention. And then therefore you'd make, you derive some sort of policy, driver policy or path planning policy on how to approach this and how to, how to change the rules depending on what the, the, the agents around you are doing. Um, so that's really it for me. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than, uh, more than happy to answer. Um, if there's anything else, um, please let me know. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamie Roche, for that very interesting session. So if you all have any questions, you can drop them in the comment section on either YouTube or Facebook. Um, we have one question here uh, from YouTube that asks, is Google Assistant also a part of an artificial intelligence? Yeah, so Google, Google Assistant or Amazon um, or Siri, they're all, um, so what, 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 what they've done is a, is a form of NLP, natural language processing. So what, what they've done is essentially they've collected lots of different, um, they've generated database, database of questions and they've provided some sort of meaning as to what these questions are and they're training Google, Google or Siri or Alexa on how to answer these questions. They're pulling information, so they're scraping information from the questions that you ask and then pulling um, a reference that they've learned from in the past and then providing you with an answer in that. So, you know, Google Assistant is using some form of AI. It's not probably, it, it's not the pinnacle of AI because that sort of research has been worked on for a number of years. Um, where the pinnacle of AI is going is going on to things like um, reinforcement learning, um, uh, because you're. I, I talked a little bit about it, where I said there's like that uh, issues with data disparity, where data isn't proficient or isn't isn't prolific enough, and people don't have access to data. So, for example, the data they use to train Google Assistant isn't isn't available anywhere. Um, so if you ever wanted to understand exactly how Google Assistant works, you'd have no way of doing that, you know. So to as a researcher, because we don't have that access to that information, we've had to find ways around that. And that's where things like areas of reinforcement learning is becoming more prolific and semi-supervised machine learning. Because these areas don't require the same quantities of data that Google Assistant requires, you know. So if you're interested in natural language processing, the best approach is to start looking at things like, you know, semi-supervised and reinforcement intent. And you can put those down now, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamie. Uh, another question yeah, is, since this is a relatively new area, are there reference projects available or best practices or any documentation on uh, multimodal ML? So no, it's not. There's no there's no best practices. Um so I, I guess I guess the thing like ultimately I, I talked a little bit about it and it's it's one area that I'm very interested in, is sort of like the history of AI. And over over the last hundred or so years that we've we've had a very evolving approach in how we see AI. You know, if you go back to like the nineteen thirties and talk to somebody about artificial intelligence or robots, they'd usually give you something of a tin man, you know what I mean, that stands there and can answer any question that you put to it. But we, we, our view of AI has changed over the last while. We're no longer seeing artificial intelligence as a sort of a singleized, a singleized unit that can do everything. For example, you know, we no longer see AI that as a system that can make me a cup of tea and then, you know, go cleaning the house in the afternoon and then iron the shirts in the evening, you know. We're seeing AI as sort of we're addressing compartmentalized problems. So we're looking at specific problems and then finding solutions to those specific problems. And then by combining these different machine learning algorithms or framework together, you're going to evolve into some form of semi super or sorry uh, into into some some form of multi-model machine learning where these 
ML algorithms are working in unison to solve a much bigger problem. You know, so years down the road, when 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 they've addressed the problems of AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, you're going to see that it's not it's not going to compose of one single um, all defining algorithm. It's going to be composed of many different algorithms, which is is very akin to the way we work. You know. We we have uh, we have networks which are specifically like in 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 our brain we have networks which are specifically their job is to mainly process vid visual data. We have you know networks in our brain that mainly main, their job is to mainly process how we how we walk you know. So the way the way rather than having one single AI algorithm that does everything, it's going to be lots of little AI algorithms that sort of form together to create the illusion of general intelligence. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very detailed response. Uh, for everyone out there, it's still not too late to register your solutions for Hack AI 2021. You have till December 21st to submit your solutions and register. Solution is selected as a finalist for Hack AI. You will get the opportunity to be mentored by domain experts and the winners will be awarded cash prizes. And it seems we don't have any other questions today. So thank you very much, Dr. Demi, Jamie Roche, for such an educational session. And thank you for everyone who joined today. Thank you.